All right, so AML life cycles. So really, the animal life cycle is basically this organization of the events leading from conception all the way up to reproduction and beyond. So in an animal life cycle, animals undergo fertilization. And during that fertilization, we see the union of a gamete from mom, which we're going to say contains N chromosomes. So an N containing gamete. Mom is going to fuse to an N containing gamete from that. 2 plus 2. I'm sorry, n plus n rather, gives you 2n. So at this point of fertilization, we go from having n gametes to two n gametes to fusing them together to form a 2n cell. Now this 2n cell that's just been formed through the fusion of our gametes we are going to refer to in animals as zygotes. So in terms of Yeah, let me just thank you all for putting out normal books. <laughs> so this zygote in humans, n equals 23, so 2n equals 46. So this first cell has 46 chromosomes, everything required to become and to be human. So right at this point, it's unequivocal that this cell is human. No other possibility. And so this zygote begins to undergo growth. And that growth initially is going to occur through mitosis. And as we go through mitosis, we go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, so on and so forth. So we have more cells that are accumulated, each of them contain the exact same copy of those original 46 cells that were brought together by uh, fertilization. All of these cells, because they're coming from mitosis, are maintained in their 2N orientation. Now, as the cells progress, hopefully you remember back to the hierarchy of biology, if I take multiple types of similar cells and I begin to put them together, what do I want to remember? Cells become tissue, tissues become organs. So we're beginning to develop the ability to produce tissues here. And we're going to begin to develop tissues. And there's a whole bunch of embryogenesis that occurs here that is beyond the, uh, the, the level of this class for now. What I want you to know is that we have multiple cells coming together, more and more cells being developed. So we're beginning to develop tissue. What do you think one of the tissues is that we're going to begin to develop? Okay, we're definitely going to produce. Blood. But how about in terms of meiosis? Where does meiosis occur? Okay, what type of tissue is that? <laughs> <laughs> what part of the reproductive tissue are we discussing here? That's where the gene begins. Okay, it's with the nerve. Germ <laughs> <laughs> So 
So as we're developing all these other tissues through mitosis, our germline begins to develop as well. Now that germline is where our sex era, our sex um, our sex cells begin to develop. So in that germline, as all of these other cells are developing through mitosis, the germline's production begins to shift to produce gametes through meiosis. So in the germline, we'll have cells, we'll have individual cells. What type of compositions or chromosomes do you think we'll have for this first primordial cell in the germline? It's going to be just like all of our other cells, so it's going to be 2N. So we'll have one of our 2N cells. that's going to undergo meiosis 1 that will lead towards one cell in a 4N composition. So one 2N cell one becomes one 4N cell. Then that 4N cell divides to produce two cells in each have 2N. We don't have another duplication event as you go into meiosis 2, and the end of meiosis 2 is for those two 2N two cells to become four 1N cells, or just simply four N cells. This is occurring while the somatic cells, the body cells, continue to develop new tissues, continue to produce more and more cells that are in that. 2N, uh, in that 2N composition, 46 chromosomes present if it's a human. And then the meiotic division occurs as well. So, at this point, the organism is pretty well developed and eventually go through stages of development called puberty and things like that. And we begin to actually be able to utilize these germline cells that have been produced. Hopefully, if you're married, not because of a bad decision, fertilization will occur. <laughs> it's very subtle anti. <laughs> <laughs> so, fertilization by a gamete starts the whole life cycle or a new life cycle. And we're back up to the beginning here where we started today with fertilization, fusion of N gamete and N gamete to a 2N cycle. Now, for this original individual that we've just gone through their life cycle, their life cycle will continue, produce probably additional offspring, starting new life cycles in their offspring, and they'll progress through aging until they get to the final life, uh, the final stage of the life cycle. Yeah. So this next uh, this next life cycle that's being started would be the offspring, or it would be our next generation. Now, even if you are a twin from the same egg. Aren't you a twin? Yeah. But you're a Never mind. Unless you are a, tw a twin from the same egg, you don't look anything like your siblings. And even if you're from the same egg, you know, some of resemble each other pretty well, but some of each other do not identify. And we call that genetic diversity. Okay. So all of you look very different from each other. 
So how do we actually achieve that genetic diversity? Especially within a family. Is that crossing over? Not in brain. <laughs> Okay, so let's produce some genetic variation. There are actually three main factors. Three main factors that will generate genetic uh, variation and genetic diversity, diversity within a population. The first thing is independent assortment of chromosomes, also sometimes referred to as random assortment. So this independent or random assortment of chromosomes occurs with the development of the metaphase plate during meiosis. So the metaphase plate forms, and when the metaphase plate forms, it forms so that random distribution becomes possible. So take a look at this figure over here. So I basically have two different possibilities here if this organism just simply has two chromosomes. And you can see that the two chromosomes are going to be this big chromosome and the smaller chromosome. And of course they have a partner, they have a sister. And so the sisters are shown red and blue. And you can think of the two chromosomes based off of size as being like chromosome one, chromosome two, and then the two different colors being blue from dad, red from mom. Okay? So this random distribution, the way that these chromosomes can align on the metaphase plate can be different. In this example, you can see that chromosome 1 and chromosome 2 from dad align on one side of the plate. Chromosome 1 and chromosome 2 from mom align on the plate. Remember that these homologous chromosomes, they carry potentially different genetic sequences. So they may carry some genes that would be totally identical, but chances are they carry some of their genes that are slightly different. And so you end up with a hemoglobin molecule that works a little bit more efficiently in dad, but not as efficiently in mom. And so you get that kind of variation. The second possibility is that when the metaphase plate forms, you have just the opposite occur, where you mix the chromosomes between uh, mom and dad, or lining up so that you get a chromosome from mom and a chromosome dad to be able to go into the new cells that are developed. So notice that you have four different combinations for gametes just for this single two chromosome organism. So when this splits, you get that metaphase two, chromosomes from dad, chromosomes from mom, and then you end up with gametes that just contain chromosomes from uh, either from dad or chromosomes from mom, or if you have the alignment where chromosomes from mom and dad are uh, aligned into both of the two cells, then you get these additional combinations. Okay, so four different combinations from just two chromosome forming. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So let me give you the math here on the uh, two chromosome organism, and then we'll apply it to humans to see what this does. So a two chromosome organism. we end up with two metaphase plate orientations. And that results in four possible daughter cells. So two chromosome organisms, 
produce two different possible metabase plates, which means four possible daughter sets. Mathematically, the way that we can represent this is just to say, simply say the number of chromosomes as the as the power. So this is our number of chromosomes. And this is the number of pairs of cells, or of chromosomes. Number of chromosomes, number of pairs, end up with four possible outcomes. Yes. So let's apply that now to a 23 chromosome organism such as humans. So now we're going to take two pairs times 23 individual chromosomes, two to the 23. And if you do that real quick in your head, eight million combinations. So what does that mean? It means that each human has at least eight million different types of gametes that they can generate. And chances are, for men, you're producing multiple individual units of each of those 8 million combinations every time you go through spermatogenesis. Typically, typical fertility for men is to produce about 100 million sperm. Each of those 100 million sperm is going to be one of those 8 million combinations. So what would be, just this alone, what would be the probability of producing this exact same offspring? Eight million times eight million, which is 64 trillion. It's one in 64 trillion. So that's a lot of babies. <laughs> Finally, after four million years, I finally got the same version of Tommy. <laughs> but we don't actually end there. We actually are going to go to crossing over as well. We're going to use crossing over to increase our genetic variation. So here's a picture of what crossing over looks like. Crossing over occurs in prophase one. And basically what happens as the chromosomes condense in prophase one, as we lead towards the formation of the metaphase plate, we're going to have points of contact on our chromosomes. These points of contact are called chiasma. Now at each of these points of contact, here's a point of contact here, you can see that the genetic material between these two inner sister chromatid is going to be exchanged. Right here? Chiasma. So at each of these chiasma or points of contact, the material is switched. And then the DNA that can be inherited or placed into the gametes is going to be mixed. So if there is no chiasma that are formed, you would get this composition of your chromosomes here. If you have two points of crossing over, you can see now you have four additional chromosomes that can be distributed into individual gametes. So here's four. If there's no 
point of contact, there's four more. If there is a point of contact, then you can imagine that point of contact can occur anywhere along the chromosome. So we're talking about basically an infinitesimal number of possibilities. So 64 trillion, if we just ran the fertilization alone, is now pending to infinity. So what is the probability of you ever producing the exact same offspring? It's basically zero. There's one more factor. There are three factors, independent assortment, crossing over, and the third factor is random fertilization. Random fertilization basically means that the two parents that undergo fertilization or that generate the zygote, they are not corrected by any sort of external polymer. So at one level, random fertilization means that we don't really get green in the human population. Some areas there is some inbreeding, but there's not a lot of inbreeding that happens. In addition, random fertilization, which of these gametes that gets chosen for fertilization is entirely random. So in humans, during sexual intercourse, it's typically one egg that's going to be released, and then a hundred million sperm that are released. And any one of those hundred million sperm containing a massive amount of different types of chromosomal composition can fertilize the egg. So for each parent, if we ignore crossing over, which we cannot, but if we just ignore crossing over, kind of back to the math that I've already let you in on here, there are 8 million possible gametes per parent. That's if we ignore crossing over. It's much higher if we incorporate crossing over it into the equation. So 8 million times 8 million different zygotes that can be produced. So ignoring crossing over 8 million times 8 million different zygotes that are possible. So the two parents. This is 64 trillion. 64 trillion kids with no repeats. Again, in the morning, we had to cross them over. We had to cross them over and it basically tends all the way up to Anyone have any questions about mitosis or meiosis? Does everybody have everything they need here? Repeats.
you want to label this something we call classic genetics. Does anyone happen to know who the father of classic genetics is? He discovered DNA. But it was right around that same time. Contemporaneous individuals. He was a Moravian monk. And stuffed with peas. His friends would call him Gray. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel is the father of classic genetics. There's a picture of Gregor Mendel. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> One of the smartest people to ever live, you can make fun of him. So, Gregor Mental, he was trained as a researcher, but he was also he was also a monk. He lived in a monastery. And through his training as a researcher, he was exposed to like-minded individuals. And so not only did he get that training and had exposure that helped him to cultivate his own training, uh, he had opportunities in the garden at the monastery. Peas. So it just happened to be that the monastery that he was placed in also had a, a pea garden. He could have been in the monastery the next time over, but he might not have had classic genetics. It was just this random happenstance assignment at this particular monastery with pea plants. And they bred pea plants. They bred pea plants at this particular monastery. And through his training as a researcher and his heightened sense of observation through that training, he began to observe in these pea plants different patterns that began to develop. And this allowed him to become interested in how these plants would develop the diversity that he was observing. So we're going to call that inheritance. So he became very interested in inheritance in plants. And he began to pragmatically and systematically set up breeding schemes with these pea plants where he knew many characteristics of the parents, was able to measure in detail the characteristics of the offspring and the offspring of the offspring. And we call those cross experiments. So we have cross experiments. So here would be an example of uh, type of breeding that he may do. And you'll notice that he actually looked at a variety of different characteristics from these plants. Looked at the pod shape, the pod morphology, and the pea morphology, the pea color, the pod color. He looked at the color of the flowers. They also looked at positions of leaves on the stem. Each of these became an observable trait. These traits were dichotomous. And he would only work with dichotomous traits. And what that means to be dichotomous, that term dichotomous means that each trait, there were 
are only really two options. In other words, it was a white flower and a purple flower and not white and pink and red and green and yellow and black and purple, but just white and purple. So there wasn't a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different colors in that characteristic of the flower color, but just two options. Now the reason that he probably did this, and I honestly never read why he would have just chosen just to work with those traits, but it was probably because of his research background. And researchers are taught to follow this thing called, uh, or are told to be parsimonious. Parsimonious just simply means work simple. And so we start with the simple and try to understand the simple and add in new complexities as we develop. Okay? So we don't go to try to solve the whole world with a theory of everything. We try to break it up into small little simpler parts. And that's probably what was going on here. So two characteristic or two traits for each characteristic. The example that I'm showing here is going to be plant height. And we had one characteristic or one trait for this height characteristic that was called tall. And the other short is actually not very historically accurate. It was actually referred to as dwarf. But you can use short as well. But we're going to use dwarf. So we had a tall plant and we had a dwarf plant. And we put those plants together and we breed them. Now, one other criteria that was required here is for each of these plants to be true breed. And what a true breeding plant means is when that plant is fertilized to another plant with the exact same characteristics, the offspring are produced identical to the parents, generation after generation after generation. So true breeding plants or true breeding organisms produce offspring that are equivalent to the parents. Another way to put this idea of true breeding is to say that two tall plants will produce tall offspring. Two short or dwarf plants will only produce dwarf offspring. So you can sort of imagine the rigorousness of this type of design. First, he has to go through and confirm that he actually has true breeding plants. So if you read multiple generations, and if they were all tall or all dwarf, then he would pull out individuals from each of those cohorts of plants, one being tall, one being dwarf, and would cross them or breed them together. So after he established true breeding plants, he'd go through and he'd do these cross-pollination. He'd do these cross-pollination scenarios where he would take two of the different true breeding plants. He would call it in. And this was a very intensive process. He would do this for hundreds of different types of plants in each individual experiment. And he would have to take uh, a um, paintbrush and pull the sex gametes from one plant and put it onto the sex gametes of another plant and vice versa. So he mechanically pollinated all of these plants and then he would set them up so that they were isolated from being pollinated by other plants that were not part of the experiment. So they were reducing this experimental error as much as possible. So we would cross-pollinate two different true breeding pea plants. So in our example, tall by the dwarf. And most of the time, everything else was exactly the same. So purple flowers. Uh, pea pods that were plump versus wrinkled. The pea plant would be both brown, so 
no other differences, just simply the height of the plate. So height was the only difference. So this cross-pollination, this was called hybridization. And the hybridization process would start out by emasculating one of the parents. Remember that plants, they have both the male and the female sex organs. And so one of these plants, tall or short, would be emasculated. Simply, we would remove the male sex organ, which is called the stem, from one of those plants. And then we would mechanically fertilize, so we'd be left over, only left over with the female, uh, the, the female part of the reproductive organs in male um, carbon, ovaries in the carbon. Emasculate means get rid of the male sex organ from the plant, leaving just the female sex organ left over. And then we'd undergo a mechanical fertilization. And so we would take the pollen from an intact plant to the carpal of the other. It's going to be that carpal that has just been fertilized that will mature to a pod. And then that pod contains a, what we would call the peas, what we would eat for dinner. Those are the plant seeds. So we plant the seed. That would now be the offspring. And we plant them, and then the next generation would grow up. So the next generation grows. And so now we have the offspring, and we do the exact same thing again, the exact hybridization procedure, grow up a second generation. So we repeat the whole process. And we would plant those seeds, and we'd get a second generation to pop up. So we'd have the parent generation, we'd have the first filial generation, F1, the second filial generation, F2. And we could measure the characteristics or observe the characteristics, count up the number of different types of offspring that we have, how many tall, how many dwarf, and we could begin to track the heritability. So here's that cross, our tall and our dwarf plants being crossed, generating an F1 generation and then generating an F2 generation. So whenever you're looking at these heritability studies in classical genetics, you start out with the P generation, which is called, or which is the, the name for the parents. So our P generation in this example is going to be a tall plant bred to a dwarf plant. And by the way, he would do two experiments for each of these traits. And he would emasculate the tall plant and then fertilize with the dwarf. And then the second experiment, he would emasculate the dwarf plant and then fertilize with the tall. Okay? And he would observe what happened in both situations, and most of the time, all of the time, he had basically the exact same results, regardless of how he uh, had the mechanical fertilization and emasculation. So a tall times a dwarf, we end up with the F1 generation. the 
flow, the Lyle generation. And in this generation, when you breed a tall times a dwarf, you end up with all tall offspring. Now it's a good thing he didn't stop there, but he took it out to a second generation, the F2. In that F2 generation, what you would find is 75% of the offspring would be tall plants, 25% would be dwarf. This turns out to a 3 to 1 ratio. So we end up with this 3 to 1 ratio. And based off of that information, all tall in the F1, 3 to 1 ratio in the F2, he devised two hypotheses. first hypothesis is known as allelic segregation. Allelic segregation requires the definition of the term allele. And he was using this term allele to represent the alternative variation of an individual gene. So he started to say, we have a gene for plant height. And that gene for plant height has alternative, alternative versions. We have one that will dictate a tall plant and one that will dictate a short plant. So we had two alleles, tall allele and a short allele for that gene for plant height. Now he referred to the variations or the alleles as having um, the, the capability to be the uh, object or the material that's here. So we have one heritable factor. We now call that today the gene. And that heritable factor, again, the heritable factor HF and gene are going to be synonymous. That one heritable factor has two alternate versions. Or what we would call alleles. One gene, two alleles. And he took it a step further and he said of these genes, one will be dominant and one will be recessive. And if the dominant allele is present, then that allele's characteristics are those that are expressed. If only the recessive, no dominant, is present, then we'll see the characteristics of the recessive allele expressed. All right, we'll pick up with how we get from the data to hypothesis number one when we return here on Monday. Number two, four, four.